Hello and welcome. Today we're talking about cardiac tumors. These are <clears throat> rare in children, uh, only representing maybe 0.025% uh, of uh, cardiac autopsies that have been performed in, at Boston Children's Hospital. Most of these present early in life, in utero or certainly in the first year of life. And um, as we'll see, echo, magnetic resonance, and CT are the diagnostic tests of choice. This is a table from a paper published a few years ago uh, by a group uh, headed by um, Rebecca Belkim, who is here, of course, with us at Children's. Uh, Rebecca reviewed a number of tumors and their magnetic resonance imaging characteristics. And uh, this table is very helpful in trying to figure out the histology, the, the, the actual nature of the tumor based on magnetic resonance imaging studies. There are only two or three types of tumors that are particularly common at all in children, the most common of which is a rhabdomyoma. This is associated with tuberous sclerosis uh, probably more than half the time and is related to mutations in the TSC1 or Hamartin or the TSC or tuberin genes. These uh, tumors are mostly multiple, although they can occur singly as single large tumors. Mostly they involve the ventricles, although as we'll see, they can also involve the atria. Uh, and these often regress spontaneously. One theory for this is, as you can see in the lower panel on the left, <clears throat> the spider cells that are uh, associated, that are part of the histology of uh, rhabdomyomas, um, the microtubule system inside the cell uh, has a large component of ubiquitin. Uh, ubiquitin is a protein that's added uh, to structures within cells um, that are planned for destruction. Uh, so adding ubiquitin to the microtubular system seems to um, put the microtubular system in line for uh, destruction by the cell and this results in uh, apoptosis of the cell and that may be one of the mechanisms by which rhabdomyomas spontaneously regress. We know that uh, these tumors are related to mutations which result in a loss of function of the Hamerton tuberin complex uh, and this complex works uh, in a pathway that inhibits uh, the uh, mTOR or the mammalian target of rapamycin uh, growth and proliferation pathway. So mTOR is important for growth and proliferation of uh, cells. This is one reason that um, inhibitors of mTOR have been found to be useful for things like preventing um, instant stenosis or for uh, treating some kinds of malignancies. So mTOR inhibitors such as everolimus or serolimus seem to be effective uh, in reducing the size of rhabdomyomas. There are studies currently being done about this. There are some uh, small studies and um, case reports indicating that, in fact, uh, these can be quite helpful in patients who have um, complications from rhabdomyomas such as outflow tract or inflow tract obstruction. As I said earlier, rap cardiac rhabdomyomas are associated with tuberous sclerosis in probably uh, at least 30 to 50 percent, maybe even more than 50 percent uh, of cases. Uh, this uh, can be uh, apparent uh, also from uh, magnetic resonance imaging of the brain. You can see these tubers uh, around the ventricular system in the brain. Uh, and other signs. Uh, the neurologic consequences of tuberous sclerosis, of course, can be quite important, important with uh, epilepsy and uh, dementia being uh, some of the problems that can be seen. This is an example of a heart with a rhabdomyoma. We opened the right atrium here. You can see the typical pectinate muscles.
uh, of the right atrium, fossa ovalis, and the superior vena cava entering the atrium here. If we now look uh, in the ventricle, you can see that there is a large yellowish mass here in the anterior wall as well as in the interventricular septum. These are both rhabdomyomas. This is the pulmonary outflow tract. If we look in the septum, you can see that this tumor extends uh, all the way across to the left ventricular side of the septum as well, so it's uh, transeptal. And looking in the left ventricular side, you can see there's a extension of the tumor out into the cavity. There's another tumor in the left ventricular free wall, also involving uh, one of the papillary muscles here. You can see how it's been cut, and there's a yellow tumor involving that. So here on the septum, you can see there are a couple of excrescences from this tumor extending out into the cavity. And if we put the ventricle back together, you can see that this causes significant left ventricular outflow tract obstruction, which was the cause of demise uh, in this patient. There's another uh, mass here uh, in the left atrium near the AV junction, probably extending across it. Uh, this is a pulmonary vein. Here's the left atrial appendage uh, within the left atrium. There's another small mass uh, back here on the posterior aspect of the heart. This is another uh, example of a rhabdomyoma. We're looking into the right atrium here. And this is the tricuspid valve orifice. You can see pectinate muscles here. And within the orifice of the tricuspid valve, you can see a tu tumor mass. Uh, and this is uh, a rhabdomyoma that was causing severe inflow tract obstruction into the right ventricle. If we now open the annulus of the valve, you can see this uh, tumor has sort of three heads uh, associated with it. Uh, and it is virtually completely obstructing uh, the inflow. There are probably other rhabdomyomas here in the atrium. Now we're looking at this down into the ventricle where it's been cut, uh, and you can see how this uh, essentially completely obstructs uh, the tricuspid valve orifice in this case, and that was the cause of demise uh, in this patient. This is an echocardiogram in a patient with a large single rhabdomyoma, here you can see the tumor, the typical ground glass appearance of the tumor uh, in the left ventricular free wall. This is uh, another look at the same tumor. You can see that it uh, virtually completely obliterates uh, the cavity toward the apex of the ventricle. This is another patient with a rhabdomyoma. This involves the mitral valve here. You can see the tumor here, and this is the anterior mitral leaflet left ventricular outflow, and you can see how it is obstructing the inflow of the mitral valve. If we look at the same tumor in a parasternal long axis view, again you see the tumor here obstructing the, the left ventricular inflow tract. In another patient, uh, we can see a couple of uh, tumors here extending out into the cavity of the right ventricle near the apex. So this is a patient with multiple smaller rhabdomyomas that are extending out into the right ventricular cavity. This uh, panel uh, has uh, a number of magnetic resonance images uh, in it. Uh, here we see a T1 weighted uh, image and you can see this is the rhabdomyoma in this case. This is normal myocardium over here. And the rhabdomyoma on T1 is maybe slightly uh, hyper, uh, uh, rather, uh, or in some areas uh, more iso with uh, respect to the uh, myocardium. On T2 weighted imaging, it seems to be a little bit hyper uh, over here compared to the rest of the myocardium, although not so much compared to the left ventricular myocardium. With fat suppression, we can see, you can see the fat out here in the subcutaneous tissue is suppressed on this uh, sequence, uh, but we don't see suppression within the tumor, so it's not a, uh, 
uh, um, lipomatous tumor. And on delayed gadolinium enhancement here, uh, we don't see significant uh, delayed enhancement uh, in this tumor. It's quite dark uh, like uh, the rest of the myocardium. It's just the blood pool that lights up in this case. And if we look at this one uh, in a sine, you can see we're starting to the right uh, and going to the over to the left, right ventricle. Here's the tumor uh, here uh, in the left ventricular wall. So this is a big tumor. You would be hard pressed to be sure this wasn't uh, a fibroma, in fact, except the delayed gadolinium enhancement uh, gives that away. Usually, rhabdomyomas don't need specific treatment because they tend to regress spontaneously. Uh, and even when multiple, even when large, often don't cause any hemodynamic consequences or arrhythmias. Um, however, there are uh, examples uh, that we've seen of rhabdomyomas that can produce either inflow obstruction or outflow obstruction of one ventricle or the other and that can be associated with significant uh, arrhythmias. Um, in such cases, uh, resection of the tumor may be indicated, uh, or use of mTOR inhibitors uh, may be helpful to reduce the size of the tumor uh, and uh, mitigate the uh, hemodynamic consequences. The second most common type of tumor that we see in childhood is a fibroma. It's quite a bit less common than rhabdomyomas, but we certainly uh, do see these tumors. These are usually large and solitary. They're often in the interventricular septum or the left ventricular free wall, less frequently in the right ventricular free wall. Uh, these uh, are mostly fibrous tumors. They don't have a great uh, vascular supply, so we see necrosis and calcification in the middle of the tumor as it uh, <clears throat> loses a vascular uh, supply to the to the central part of the tumor. Uh, the one of the major consequences, one of the major complications of fibroma uh, is ventricular arrhythmia and sudden unexpected death. Uh, this is the mode of presentation in some patients with these tumors. This is associated with Gorlin syndrome, uh, which is a um, um, associated with cutaneous uh, basal cell carcinomas, multiple cutaneous basal cell carcinomas. Uh, you can see here at the lower left an example of one of these tumors. The centimeter ruler at the bottom indicates that this tumor is about uh, eight or nine centimeters uh, across. These are quite, quite large multilobulated tumors. Uh, you can see in the middle that it's mostly fibrous tissue. Uh, and on the right side, um, in a, in a uh, trichrome stain in blue, you can see uh, the fibrous tissue at the bottom with some myocardium near the uh, external part of the tumor uh, toward the top. This is an example of an electrocardiogram in a patient who presented with ventricular tachycardia with one of these tumors. The chest x-ray on the right, of course, shows a large heart with an unusual left heart border consistent with the presence of the tumor. Myocardial cells can be entrapped or uh, interdigitate into the edge of the tumor. On the left panel here, you can see a trichrome stain uh, with the fibrous tissue in blue and myocardium shown in red. So you can see the tongues or little strips of myocardium that run through the fibrous tissue. Uh, we think that uh, this is most likely the physical substrate for a reentrant um, pathway. Uh, the myocardium in here uh, histologically uh, looks uh, a bit uh, unusual. The cells are somewhat uh, flattened and small uh, and may have abnormal um, conduction characteristics, which make for perhaps slow conduction through this pathway. And this uh, may well be uh, the explanation for the ventricular tachycardia. On the right panel is a Desmond stain, which shows that these uh, actually are myocytes uh, and not just uh, other forms of, of tissue here. 
Uh, this is a heart specimen with a fibroma uh, within the interventricular septum. This is the upper part of the interventricular septum. Here's the right atrium showing pectinate muscles, the coronary sinus and the fossa ovalis. Here we see the tricuspid valve coming down into the right ventricle. Here's the septal leaflet, anterior leaflet. And now we see the interventricular septum cut, the cut edge of it. This is all tumor, this is all fibroma here within the interventricular septum. You can see that it occupies virtually all of the heart. This is an area of inhomogeneity within the fibroma, which is quite typical. This may be due to uh, poor blood supply uh, with uh, necrosis and sometimes calcification uh, within the tumors. If we now turn posteriorly and look into the left ventricle, you can see the left ventricular septal surface here, the smooth septal surface. Here's the medial leaflet of the mitral valve, left atrium in the back. This is another example of a large fibroma. Uh, this time, instead of being in the septum or left ventricular free wall, it's here off of the anterior inferior part of the right ventricle. Here's the right atrium. You can see the pectinate muscles here, the fossa ovalis, coronary sinus, and the tricuspid valve leading down into the right ventricle. The tumor is here off of the anterior wall of the right ventricle. Posteriorly, we see the left ventricle here with the medial mitral leaflet, septal surface, free wall papillary muscles here and here, and the left ventricular outflow tract here between the medial mitral leaflet and the septum, left atrium in the back. Here's the tumor here, uh, this part, this is all fibroma. You can see the anterior part of the right ventricle has been opened here. This is the anterior descending artery coming down on the interventricular septum. So you can see the right ventricular outflow tract with pulmonary valve here. So the tumor is all anterior and inferior to that. If we look at the substance of the tumor, the cut edge here, you can see it's relatively homogeneous uh, and looks like uh, fibrous tissue. This is just uh, a big fibroma. And these are several sequences, uh, MRI sequences, uh, in a patient with uh, a fibroma. You can see on T1 here that uh, it's relatively iso uh, uh, intense compared to the rest of the myocardium. This is the tumor here. Uh, on uh, T2 weighted imaging, it's a little uh, heterogeneous. You can see some areas that are a little bit hypo intense and other areas that are relatively iso intense with the uh, myocardium. Uh, there is uh, no uh, fat suppression because the tumor doesn't really contain uh, any fat tissue. The um, most important sequence here is the delayed gadolinium enhancement sequence. As we step down into the ventricle, you can see that the tumor, which is this part back here posteriorly, uh, enhances dramatically. Uh, this is the normal myocardium here in black, and it uh, shows uh, no uh, delayed uh, uptake of gadolinium, whereas the tumor itself uh, enhances dramatically with uh, uh, gadolinium. So this is a, the characteristic feature, really, of a fibroma because it is fibrous tissue is that uh, we see uh, evidence of this on delayed gadolinium enhancement. This is the Sine sequence in this patient. And as we follow this down toward the apex, you can see the tumor here. Uh, there is reasonably good left ventricular function and right ventricular function. We didn't see any uh, evidence of mitral insufficiency in this patient. The treatment for fibromas generally is resection uh, if they're producing symptoms and the anatomy is favorable. 
we have uh, generally taken the idea that most of these tumors need to be resected because uh, of the risk for sudden unexpected death. Uh, on the other hand, uh, if the tumor is extremely large and perhaps involving vital structures like uh, the uh, mitral valve, papillary muscles, uh, that sort of thing, transplantation is another potential option for patients with uh, these tumors who are having uh, arrhythmias. Uh, the third most common type of tumor that we see in childhood uh, is a myxoma. This is probably the most common type that's seen in adults, uh, but it's relatively rare in children. These usually arise from the fossil valis, um, either in the left atrium or the right atrium. Uh, they can be obstructive. They can um, uh, billow into the uh, AV valve and cause AV valve inflow obstruction. Uh, they're also uh, capable of metastasis. They can <clears throat> have little uh, sections on, on, on the outside, they're sort of crenulated and, and can break off and metastasize to other parts of the body. Uh, they usually don't um, spread like uh, a malignant uh, tumor, but uh, can cause myxoma syndrome with uh, an inflammatory process and fever um, and pain uh, from the uh, little metastatic particles. These are uh, associated with carny complex. Uh, which uh, is atrial myxomas, uh, lentigenes, multiple lentigenes in the skin, uh, as well as multiple endocrine adenomas. Uh, these tend to have a, a myxoid stroma, as you can see here in the two panels below. The light pink is just a, a fibromyxoid uh, background material with uh, a few cells uh, within it. Uh, the cells on the right tend to be in uh, linear structures, which is uh, pretty characteristic of, of myxomas. This is a heart specimen with a myxoma. We're looking at it from the front here. Right ventricle, right atrium, basso valis here, and the ventricle down below here. This is the tricuspid valve. And you can see part of the septum has been removed uh, in this heart. When we turn and look from the posterior side, you can see a tumor here extending, actually in this case, from the left atrioventricular groove. It doesn't actually come from the atrial septum uh, as most uh, myxomas do. This one is actually uh, not up here associated with the atrial septum, but comes from the atrioventricular groove here. This is the outflow in the septum. And here you can see the tumor itself. It has a, a core uh, in the middle and then uh, uh, an exterior part of the tumor that's a, a little bit darker. And you can see that there are um, nodular excrescences on the uh, outside of the tumor. This is where it uh, arises from the AV junction here. And then there are these little excrescences on the outside of the tumor. These are the uh, structures that can break off and metastasize uh, at times. So this is a, a myxoma. It's in a little unusual location, but uh, the, the appearance of the tumor is, is fairly typical. And this uh, is an echocardiogram in a patient with uh, a myxoma. You can see it coming from the atrial septum here uh, and uh, going through the mitral valve here again. Uh, is a, an apical view, and here's the myxoma coming from the atrial septum over here uh, and then prolapsing through uh, into the mitral valve. And if we put color uh, in this, you can see that there is mild uh, inflow obstruction from the uh, tumor uh, into, the, uh, into the left ventricle. The treatment for uh, myxomas is uh, simply resection on discovery. Um, Unfortunately, recurrence uh, is not so rare with these tumors, particularly if the base of the tumor is not completely resected uh, from usually the atrial wall from which it arises. There are other unusual tumor types that we see rather rarely. Lipomas can occur. Uh, intrapericardial teratoma, as we'll see in a few minutes, 
Uh, hemangiomas also occur. Rarely we can see in children malignant tumors like rhabdomyosarcoma uh, or other um, sarcomas. These are magnetic resonance images in a patient with a lipoma. Uh, these are usually small tumors. Here you can see it in the apex of the right ventricle. Uh, you can see it's a bit hyper on T1 imaging. Um, this is um, fat suppression. Uh, you can see the fat out here in the subcutaneous area has been suppressed here uh, in this image and also the uh, tumor itself is suppressed because this is uh, fat uh, and so the fat, fat suppression sequence uh, darkens uh, this part of the, of the tumor. Uh, you can see that there's also some delayed gadolinium enhancement in this tumor uh, and that's because there's often some fibrous uh, material within the tumor, fibrous septae, uh, that are, are around the, the areas of fat. And this is the um, Sine sequence in this patient. You can see the left ventricle over here looks quite normal. Here's the right ventricle. We don't see it until we get very close to the apex and there's the tumor right there uh, in the apex of the right ventricle. Pericardial teratoma is a tumor within the pericardium that's usually associated with large recurrent pericardial effusions. Uh, we can see this either in the fetus or in neonates. They, these usually are present very early in life, even before birth, uh, and in fact can uh, cause uh, morbidity and, and death in utero uh, from the large pericardial effusion. Um, <clears throat> sometimes the tumor can be difficult to, to image by echo, but uh, magnetic resonance and CT are usually quite uh, good at seeing the tumor, and usually complete removal of the tumor uh, is curative and prevents uh, recurrence of the pericardial effusion. These are magnetic resonance cine sequences in a patient with uh, a pericardial teratoma. <clears throat> and here we're looking at it in a sagittal plane. And you can see there's a large pericardial effusion out here. And this is the tumor itself. Here's the heart uh, back here. You can see the tumor in this case is really quite large. Uh, this is the same tumor in uh, a coronal plane. Here's the left ventricle and here's the tumor up here with the large pericardial effusion around it. And the same thing in an axial plane here. We can see the pericardial effusion, the heart itself, and then the tumor here coming above the right atrium and compressing uh, the right atrium quite substantially. So this is really quite a large uh, teratoma in this uh, patient. And the effusion and all is really quite characteristic of uh, uh, teratoma. Rarely we see malignant tumors uh, in uh, uh, young patients. This is an example of that. Here you can see in this uh, sequence here uh, that there is uh, an area up here of variable um, density uh, and this is the uh, area of the tumor. You can see it isn't well encapsulated like the other tumors that we've seen because it's actually invading the myocardium. This is a cine sequence in this and we're going to watch uh, up here. Here's the tumor itself uh, and you can see it looks a lot like the rest of the myocardium and it's not very well uh, differentiated or distinguished from the rest of the myocardium. And the same in uh, this uh, sequence. You can see this is a uh, a first pass perfusion uh, and this uh, actually has variable perfusion into it. Uh, some of it perfuses uh, and some in the core does not. That's probably because the tumor has outgrown its blood supply uh, in the very core uh, but still has some blood supply around the edges. So this is um, first pass perfusion in a patient with um, a malignant tumor. Here you can see there is perfusion out here in the edges of the tumor. Uh, but right in the very core, uh, there isn't much perfusion, probably because uh, the blood supply has been outstripped there. This is an example of a, an atrial sarcoma. This was a very undifferentiated sarcoma. Uh, this would be hard to tell from a myxoma. You can see it's uh, completely uh, through the atrial septum here um, and going down into the uh, mitral valve. This had metastasized in this patient by the time of presentation uh, 
uh, I think had some brain metastases. And here you can see flow around it. It's not causing any particular hemodynamic uh, disturbance in this case. And this is uh, the tumor itself after it was uh, resected. Uh, uh, so you can see what uh, this uh, actually looks like. The history associated with cardiac tumors can be quite variable. Uh, in some instances, patients are completely asymptomatic, uh, and this is a, a chance finding either um, because of an echocardiogram or a chest x-ray for whatever reason uh, reveals a, an unusual cardiac contour or something of that sort. On the other hand, uh, patients with inflow or outflow obstruction can present with heart failure or even circulatory collapse. Um, and of course, uh, palpitations or arrhythmia is another potential uh, manifestation of, of cardiac tumors, particularly fibromas, but also rhabdomyomas. On examination, the, the exam is typically pretty normal. Um, However, some very mobile tumors, particularly things like atrial myxomas that uh, can prolapse into an atrioventricular valve, can produce either a so-called tumor plop, which is the noise that the tumor actually makes when it prolapses into the valve, or uh, can produce a, a murmur of inflow or outflow tract obstruction. The electrocardiogram can be normal. Uh, one can see um, AV block, uh, repolarization abnormalities, or arrhythmias, uh, particularly things like supraventricular tachycardia or ventricular tachycardia in the case of fibromas. Uh, the chest x-ray may be unremarkable or there may be cardiac enlargement and uh, fibromas often uh, present with an unusual cardiac contour because of this large tumor mass uh, is um, distorting uh, the outline of the heart on chest X-ray. The diagnostic modalities are echo and magnetic resonance uh, for diagnosis and characterization of the tumor. Uh, the appearance uh, may uh, be relatively diagnostic of the tumor type, and certainly the tissue characteristics that we see on magnetic resonance imaging can be very helpful in trying to uh, identify the, the tumor type presence. In some cases uh, where it's ambiguous, a biopsy or uh, an open uh, exploration may be necessary to figure out the, the nature of the tumor. An intracardiac thrombus is another kind of tumor uh, that uh, um, has very different implications generally. This is associated with chamber dilatation and dysfunction. Uh, can be associated with uh, arrhythmias. Uh, we see these in Fontan pathways, certainly, uh, and they're associated with things, appliances inside the heart and vessels, things like central catheters or sometimes uh, pacing electrodes. This echocardiogram was performed in, uh, in this infant with a uh, left atrial thrombus that you can see here. Uh, at the time of formation of this, there was significant left ventricular dysfunction because this patient had a coarctation of the aorta, uh, and this thrombus had formed out of the uh, left atrial appendage. Here you can see in a short axis view as we follow this uh, down to the apex, you can see that there is some ventricular dysfunction here um, related to the coarctation, and as we follow back up, you can see the thrombus here coming out of the uh, atrial appendage. Actually, this uh, sub xiphoid view shows the relationship to the appendage even better, and you can see how it can prolapse uh, down into the mitral valve. Another type of tumor that we can see in the heart is uh, vegetation associated with endocarditis. Uh, by imaging, it can be almost impossible to distinguish between a thrombus that we saw in the other case and a vegetation. Uh, the vegetation is usually associated with things, symptoms like fever uh, or uh, embolization or, uh, and is uh, an indication of valvulitis associated with uh, an inflammatory disease, an infection or, or an inflammatory disease on uh, a valve. 
This is a, an example of a vegetation on the tricuspid valve. And this little girl had uh, endocarditis associated with an episode of pneumococcal pneumonia. And in fact, the organism here was pneumococcus. Uh, this was um, eventually uh, removed because she continued to have uh, pulmonary uh, embolization from it uh, and also had developed significant tricuspid regurgitation and that was repaired at the same time. For most thrombus or vegetation, uh, we can observe, unless they're large and mobile, and especially if they're on the left side where uh, we can have systemic embolization, then uh, this may be an indication for resection of the vegetation. Uh, for rhabdomyomas, the outcome from a cardiac point of view is usually quite good. It's rare for these tumors to cause hemodynamic compromise uh, or arrhythmias and uh, they tend to regress over time so that the cardiac outcomes for these is generally quite benign. Fibromas, on the other hand, are associated, as we said, with uh, a prevalence of sudden unexpected death, uh, as well as distortion of uh, vital cardiac structures like um, AV valves or papillary muscles that can cause dysfunction. Uh, so these tumors, even though they're histologically benign, uh, may have a much more malignant course. Uh, treatment of these uh, has been quite gratifying in that very few recurrences of arrhythmias uh, uh, have occurred in the patients uh, who've had these either completely resected or largely debulked. Um, we've seen uh, from clinical experience that even partial resection uh, of fibromas can be quite effective in preventing uh, further arrhythmias. Myxomas usually respond well to resection, although there is a, a definite uh, incidence of, of recurrence. Some of the other uh, tumors um, <clears throat> types may or may not need any treatment and may or may not have any uh, particular uh, abnormal outcome associated with them. Certainly the rare malignant tumor that uh, is uh, within the heart uh, carries a very grave uh, prognosis. Vegetations or thrombus uh, have a tendency to, to embolize. Uh, and as you can see from the um, graph here, this is a, largely a function of the size of the vegetation and the mobility, how much of the vegetation moves. Obviously, the bigger and more mobile, the more likely it is to embolize.